everybody. Let's uh, welcome to the next session. This is a round table with some of our experts. And uh, I think we did this for the first time in 2019. And I think it's a really great opportunity for all of the burning questions that everybody has in the room to be able to ask them. And even though these wonderful distinguished people on, up here are up here, I know the other experts in the room will not be shy about sharing their opinions as well, and we absolutely welcome that. Uh, this will be a kind of open session, no you know, set questions asked or anything. It's a free for all. So with that, I'm gonna ask everybody up here to briefly to introduce yourselves and say when you started working with Pompeii. Uh, I'm Mark Roberts. I'm an adult muscle neurologist. I started working in Pompeii in 2000. I'm Priya Kishnani. I'm a clinical and biochemical geneticist, and I've started working in the field since 1991. My name is Ansela Ploeg, and I'm a pediatrician in specialized in metabolic diseases, and I started to work on pompous disease in 1985. I was not born in 1805. <laughs> 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 not, not right. Not well. I, I saw perhaps my first contact with Pompe was during my, my PhD, that it was 1990. So, so I had, so I was in the Department of Neuropathology and, and did a lot of work on, on muscle tissue. And one my old boss said, this is something you have to look at. It looks like a, a Swiss cheese. It was an infantile pompe disease case because there were a lot of, of whack holes in it, and that was really the first. And the first patient was perhaps a few years later. So as you can see, we have many, many years of experience up here. And um, yeah, my experience started back in 1995 when I was diagnosed, and I met many of them. So uh, one of the things I love about Pompeii is that we are a close community. And we have experts from all over the world willing to endure some very rough travel in order to get here to San, to San Antonio. But coming soon, there will be flights direct from Germany. So keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so let's start with the audience. Do any of you have a question that you'd like to ask? Oh, come on, don't be shy. Don't, oh, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, you had to get a microphone, and we did not think about that. <laughs> Hang on one second. Oh, you have a list. So this is an open session until tomorrow morning, yeah, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to wick, uh, which, pick out which one I start with. Um, I think uh, there are several, I speak with my patient advocacy hat on. Um, there are several questions that I get asked as to, for instance, let's go with the first one. Is there a limit to how many clinical trials patients can take part on? And having been through a clinical trial of XYZ, would that immediately be an exclusion criteria to participate in another. I think the whole POMP community wants to work for the future, which is what we're all talking about. Obviously, clinical trials is part of that, but nobody wants to put their lives on the line if it's denying them opportunities for future. I think I, have I covered what you want no, to say? No, that's a great question. Um, who wants to answer it? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it is a very good question. Um, of course, first is the point, how much can you take as a patient in being part of all those trials? But as long as it is possible and, and it improves your health uh, and, and there is a, a chance of proving your health, then of course, I imagine that you, can, that you want to participate as a patient. So that's the first thing. Um, and then, 
every trial has inclusion criteria. And what most trials say is that you are not allowed to switch from one trial to another. And that's also because of uh, if you want to show the benefit of a certain drug, then it's important that you are in a stable condition uh, and that there is not uncertainty how the other work, drug works. And in fact, that's the responsibility uh, of uh, the company that, that makes the trial and there are inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria and it can be one of the exclusion criteria. Could I add one more comment because there are so many patients here. I think many of you feel this is a responsibility, but however, we as treaters really always want to reassure you that you are our patient first and we are gonna provide you with the care whether you participate or do not participate in a clinical trial. I think that is a very important message to give. And I think the second is I think you have to educate yourselves as well when you are reading the consent forms because there are some lines in between which tells you that if you participate in a particular clinical trial, and I'll give you the example of AV gene therapy of which we are a big part of, that you've pretty much vaccinated yourself and you would not be able to participate for another similar AV gene therapy trial. So I think you as a patient community should also be talking to yourselves, also be talking to your trusted clinicians and knowing that you know, there are some limitations here. And maybe also good to mention, you can always ask a second opinion if you don't know if you are going to participate in a trial, uh, if it's good for you. Thank you for your humane so, and honest replies. Um, I'd like to chime in a little bit and follow up with that. You know, one thing many of us have talked about is shared decision making. And patients have questions. What treatment should I be on? because treatment options are now available. How do I know what to do? What questions should I ask? And I think some patients are going to feel intimidated to go to their doctor and ask the questions. But from the four of you, I know that's not how you feel. You want them to ask questions. So could you speak a little to what, you know, how you would encourage patients to feel um, empowered to go to their doctors. You know, I think historically when there was only one enzyme replacement therapy, whether it was helping or not doing very much, there was uh, understandably physicians and patients together would stay on that treatment because there was no other option other than important supportive treatments such as physiotherapy, respiratory care and dietetics. But now we're in a different phase where, of course, we do genuinely have several choices. And I think we as physicians are keen to offer patients those choices and to encourage that discussion because it's a partnership as to what you would want to do. And I think I'd always emphasize that logic is personal. There are going to be some patients who do feel they're stable on myozyme. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But there are going to be many who may feel that they're starting to deteriorate, and sometimes in ways that are not easy to capture. Not necessarily that the vital capacity is changing or the six-minute walking test is changing, but the levels of fatigue and pain and other things are changing. And in that space, we can then have a, an open discussion about what treatment options you would prefer. So w we encourage that discussion. And you shouldn't feel in any way awkward about broaching that conversation. Indeed, it makes it so much easier, doesn't it, that we're all actually on the same page. Let's give you the best options. But there are options, and that's the, the most challenging thing, is that there are several products that you could actually choose to be on, and we're keen to support you. So I can add here a very little sentence on this as well. Um, <clears throat> I think um, our responsibility in a way is as, as physicians but also as researchers to give you a clear in lay language commentary on, on the situations. That's not always easy because sometimes we are in doubt what would be the best thing and that's the current situation. So currently we can't tell you which of the three enzymes is really the enzyme. 
it's good to have all three, I think, because that's you are all different. You are each an individualized patient, and therefore we will need individualized treatments, and that is only in a dialogue doable. It's not doable just with a former way of patriarchic uh, decision makers so that I say, well, this is the best answer to my trust, and I give it to you, and you need to trust me that this is the only uh, way in doing this. And so therefore, you need to have the opportunity to understand at least the core content. And here, you can really tackle us and say, well, please explain again in a real, for me, understandable language, what are the differences, what is the needs here, and, and that's really where you should really stand up and raise your voice, please. Hi, uh, Matt Wickland, uh, neuromuscular specialist back here in San Antonio, UT Health San Antonio. With the amount of phenotypic variability, speaking to your point, even within the same genotype, can you all just speak to what leads to that phenotypic variability environment, modifier genes, et cetera. Have fun. <laughs> I think that's the most uh, complex question that you ask <laughs> and that we not exactly know. One part, of course, is the activity of alpha-glucosidase. So if you have no activity of alpha-glucosidase, you have the classic infantile form of pompous disease, and if you have residual activity of alpha-glucosidase, uh, for example, most adult patients have the IVS1 uh, variant, a splicite mutation on the well allele, and a deleterious mutation on the second allele, and these have an activity up to 20%, and that always ends up in a late-onset form of pompous disease where the heart is not involved. And there are intermediate variants, and also have we shown that there is... Uh, that there are modifying factors that uh, may uh, nah, uh, mediate the amount of residual activity. But it's not only um, uh, other variants in the gene, it are also uh, variants in other genes. And in fact, Giancarlo Parenti had, a, had a, a nice talk, and he was, of course, showing that there are other uh, markers that may be of influence of, uh, of your uh, variability of disease. And then, uh, what also plays a role, I think, is uh, in your lifestyle. Um, for example, and maybe that also uh, links a little bit to the previous question. We were uh, talking about what type of enzyme uh, therapy do you need. But it's also very important that, um, and that was also addressed in the previous talks, um, that, for example, if you're uh, overweighted and you have to carry all those uh, kilos with you while you have a muscle disease, that's of course not, not, in, not in the benefit of the patients. So also that is good to address and also to keep um, now exercising, for example. Uh, yeah, and there are all kinds of things that you could do to, uh, to keep your uh, as good as possible. Uh, so that is also equally important and I think that has also been shown in the previous uh, presentations. Very quick comment, you, you, you <coughs> to transfer this in, in lay language, because that was already a scientific answer in a, in a way. Look at your, if you have kids, look at your kids. Every kid is a different one. And that gives you the variety of genetics in the background. And, and this is also within a disease. So therefore, the phenotypic spectrum is always reflected in all what is in your genes, and not only what is on the disease side. And therefore, you have impact from your grandpas, from whatever your trade-off. And, and that's something you have also to keep in mind. So, so that is in lay language, perhaps, to transfer what Arndt was giving in scientific language. Thank you very much, Benedict. <laughs> yeah. Benedict, after I give the scientific aspect, yeah. you can do the lay language for us. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I think to what Arndt's point is, it's really well and very clear that if you're at the most severe end of the disease spectrum, the modifiers are really not going to do too much. You're going to have classic infantile. If you have that combination or similar combinations which is seen in infantile, you're going to present with infantile. For the rest of the disease spectrum, like in any other autosomal recessive condition where you have you know, two variants or two changes, one from each parent, 
uh, that combination can result in a variable phenotype. But I think also we have to think now in the genomic world and the omic world where, again, as Anz pointed out, and we've actually completed a study on this, even something as simple as sensory neural hearing loss, we know it's a part of Pompeii, but you can have sensory neural hearing loss due to other genetic conditions as well. And we are finding that patients can have not one, but maybe two other conditions in addition to Pompeii, which modifies the phenotype. And so I think us taking this broad approach, even as we think about treatment trials, is becoming increasingly important to think outside the box when anything you know seems out of the ordinary for a particular patient. Yes, um, we have a virtual question. Are there specific combinations of GAA variants that are predictive of when symptoms onset, severity of those symptoms, and effectiveness of ERT? Said another way, how significant is the particular combination of GAA variants in consideration of the patient's care plan? <laughs> I think it's very significant. In fact, as we just mentioned, if you have two very severe mutations, then you have the classic infantile form of pompous disease, and that is the most severe form of pompous disease. So that is very relevant. If you have the IVS1 mutation in combination with another mutation, it can be all over the place. But also there are, but then, uh, are variants in the gene or outside the gene that can uh, modify the phenotype. So with the IVS1, you always have a late onset form of pompous disease, whatever the mutation is on the second allele. And if you have two very severe mutations, and you can look it up in the pomp variant database, uh, that's always a, a classic, uh, classic infantile form of pompous disease. And, and to build on that again is for classic infantile, there's also the CRIM negative and the CRIM positive, which is really becoming now the standard of care. It is part of the labels that if someone is CRIM negative, the importance of immune tolerance induction. So I think, yes, knowing what the variants are, are extremely important in how you manage your patient. But the last question, what we can't uh, answer currently is the situation with what is the mutation that best predicts the best treatment? So that's unclear. That's even for the infantile onset still unclear, and for the late onset definitely it's unclear. So there's not a predictive good one or a predictive bad one that is responding better or worse on, on, on treatment. I'd agree with, with you, Benedict, entirely. So, you know, clearly if patients are symptomatic, and we had this big discussion earlier about finding patients through newborn screening programs, everyone should be given treatment. Because you, the, the, the big challenge, of course, is, is the unknowable unknowable where you might be in five or ten years' time. So if there's clear symptomatic change, I think irrespective of the mutations, patients should be treated. Okay, so let's go to Nina and then back to the room and then over there. Oh, okay. Okay, Brian first. So... Um, my, my question is, uh, I've been on ERT for 15, 17 years, and um, Genzyme and Amicus are very upfront. It's not a cure, right? It's a, tr it's a treatment. But after a long time, you get, you get frustrated. You know, you're, you're, you're declining and life, life gets harder. Um, so I guess my question is, gene therapy, I is it a cure? Excellent question, and we wish it was a cure, but I would not say there's still lots of work to be done. The ultimate goal is a one-time treatment, but we haven't come, in my humble opinion, to that absolute perfect one-time treatment. It's work in progress, but we're still not there. I think it's different in Europe, but in the United States, when they advertise drugs, new drugs, they say, ask your doctor. So ask your doctor, you guys, if you have a patient who is naive, 
which drug do you recommend? If you are on myozyme and you really you want to stay on myozyme, that is perfectly fine, as Mark said. But if you feel that you're deteriorating, which of the two other drugs would you recommend? She's heading right to the chase. I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's for the US rather easy because currently for naive patients, if I'm not completely wrong, you can't only take the Sanofi product because the Amicus product is not licensed for naive treatments, if I'm not, f so yeah. So therefore that's the situation, so therefore it's a in, in low brainer. The situation is much more difficult in Europe where you have uh, all the options and you can treat everyone with all of the three enzymes. But the fair answer, I think, and, and you will agree on this, is currently we can't decide it. It's a person to person really approach you have to do. You have to say every patient what is the good and the bad side of the type of treatment, what are the data we have we can rely on. But there's no decision maker. There's definitely from both the clinical trials we can't, and even if you look then in the, the long-term uh, treatment <coughs> data Mark presented this morning, there's no clear signal currently we can say this drug works better in that person and this will be better. There's a little guidance we can give, of course. If you look at the primary outcomes, you would say perhaps is for motor function currently one enzyme superior to the other and the other is more on the respiratory function, but even that is not fully true. So therefore there is no clear signal in my eyes for which one is the decision maker for a patient currently. We need much more so-called real world data. Yes. So, yes. so no. Nina, Nina, yeah, Nina, you, li you leave it to the patient. No, 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 no. It's, no. no, no. it's an inner debate, in a discussion, in a debate with the patient. So, so you have to see uh, what is the time of the infusion, what is available in your state. So that's that's always a uh, difference. But there is no clear uh, answer to this, and it's like in other diseases. So if if I look at hypertension, in hypertension you have tons of treatments. There are guidelines on it, but even in the guidelines you have. Uh, on one level always a lot of drugs and there it's still the individualized situation with the patient and the decision really patient by doctor together and we can't say this is the good one it is the bad one and normally the patients are very well informed they always come to us and say well I would love to go on this drug that's a very my experience in my own and I would never uh, say, no, you don't go to this one, you go on the other one. And a lot of them still come and say, myozyme is okay for me. I would have, there's a good bundle of data sets from myozyme from long, long experience with that. Why shouldn't I start with myozyme? And I would never say, no, you don't should. Just to build on, yeah. on Nina's question um, and indeed yeah. Benedict's earlier answer. <coughs> so we're all relatively young. And <laughs> We all remember the old doctors, the very good old doctors in many ways, but they were very paternalistic. They would dictate to the patient, this is what you should do. Why? Because I'm your father. I've told you what to do. You do what your father tells you. Now, our approach now, but just to come to your comments, Nina, is to be more patient-centric, to give genuine patient choices, but we're not asking the patient, please, you tell me what you would like to go on, we're trying to portray the choices they have, and then together we come to a joint decision. And you won't be surprised that often patients find this choice bewildering. And they will often say, what would you do if you were advising your sister and she had Pompeii? And that opens up the debate. And then you can explore what motivates that patient's choice versus another patient's choice and accepting that we'll all have different views, whether it be on mechanisms of action, duration of fasting, data sets, naive versus switch patient data, and so on. So I think it's a genuine discussion with the patient and making the patient the center of the discussion, and we help in that process. But I agree entirely with Benedict. We simply can't say that one of the new treatments yet is superior. Well, in your country, it does say that in the-, in the, in the I have a question so. over here. <laughs> we have a question over here. Yeah, one second. Let's may, I, may I have one? I think what 
if, if you look at the trials that have been done so far, these trials are not fully comparable because they have, uh, they have been performed in a different way and the Amicus trial has mainly uh, done the trial in uh, ERT experienced uh, patients while the Sanofi trial was more uh, naive versus or uh, uh, algalucosides alpha against Nexviadim uh, in naive patients. So that is not comparable and, and also both trials uh, did not meet their uh, primary endpoint. And in fact, what you showed, Mark, is that both uh, showed a significant difference on the secondary endpoint. So in fact, and also there were 50 different centers uh, involved in these trials. So I think we should also be realistic. There is not yet a tremendous um, yeah, game changer uh, in these trials. And I think now, although we all have the impression it's, it's slightly better, so I think we need more real weight, world data, and we have to do that together with you, with the doctors, uh, to finally decide what's the best for the patient. Could I just add one thing? In my opinion, we know, and we have developed Myozyme as a group together. We have next generation therapies. That is the question, which one? But I, I personally tell my patients, to try and go with the next generation therapy because the mechanism of action has shown better and more efficient targeting. And if you look at the data from either the naive trials or from the switch trials, there is biomarker evidence of further reduction and there is some evidence of a benefit. So I at least try and talk to my patients. I'm not telling them what to do, but I also try and tell them that next generation <coughs> therapies do have a mechanism of action which makes them more efficient for skeletal muscle targeting. Uh, let's okay. let's hear a new question. Hello. Hello. One, Can I one ask a quick one, question? Perhaps one really final comment. There's, there's one thing, we, we, if we really be honest on the situation, for the most uh, wheelchair-bound and even ventilated uh, patients, we don't have any data on the new enzymes. We don't know it. So, so this is really something you also please have to keep in mind. These studies had clear uh, selection criteria which patient was in it, and this is a third to even 40% of our patients with pompe disease with the long term is where we don't have this data. What happened to them with the new enzymes? And this is something all else we need to discuss with the patients. So we can't really tell you the truth based on the data set if this is really helpful if we switch, we hope, and of course I agree completely with what Bria was saying, that the mechanism of actions is better, hopefully, in the new enzymes, so therefore you should switch finally, but we definitely can't say if this is really completely helpful. So it's a yeah. bet for the future, and of course we go for it because we see that the side effects are good balanced, so there's new, new things we will see, and therefore there's a big trust for us, but hopefully then also for you as a patient, that you can go on this. Okay, we're gonna jump all the way to the end. Yeah. Okay. I just have a, it's a basic, general, but complex question probably. Um, how did we come up with the current dosing? I mean, what was it originally based on? Um, were we, is it just a balance between safety, efficacy, manufacturability? Is it based on trying to restore um, enzyme activity to wild type levels. It just seems, and have we looked at, have you, has anybody looked into imaging of some non invasive imaging to see how much enzyme is actually getting into the muscle? I think, I think it's understood that it's low, but there's, it seems like we're kind of just dosing blindly and there, there's just not a lot of basis to it. Can you elaborate on that? Another really easy question. Yes. <laughs> Um, it, it is an easy question because if you, for example, look in another metabolic condition like Fabry disease, you're dosing at one milligram per kilogram. So the dose that's been used in Pompe disease, whether it be in LOPD, 20 milligrams per kilogram, body weight every two weeks, is an enormous dose. What seems very clear, though, particularly in the infants and the young children, is the higher doses are absolutely necessary. But I, I wouldn't want you to think that the dose was low. The dose is actually, at a protein level, enormous. 
but appropriately enormous, <laughs> particularly in children. Well, <laughs> of course you may be right. Any effect on the cardiac hypertrophy while it will have at the higher dosing. Whether the higher dosing is safe, I can't tell. Mm. But I know that the dosing is too low to have any effect on the cardiac problems in Fabrice disease. That's a very fair comment. I was just giving you a, um, an idea of the comparator. <laughs> comparator. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. Yeah. We conclude <laughs> that uh, dosing is highly relevant. Yeah. Dr. Maffrey. Okay, okay no, it's not a, qu uh, a question and a, a comment to, to continue uh, uh, the difficult discussion about the decision uh, making. Uh, wh what we are doing in France is um, for all the new therapies, because uh, Pompe is not the only uh, disorder with uh, innovative therapies and a lot of questions, we have a multidisciplinary discussion. So it's not the, the only the, the physician who treats the patient makes the decision of switching or not and which drug. It's a, a collegial discussion. We have the example of spinal atrophy. It's a very recent uh, uh, um, innovative uh, therapies. We have two therapies. Uh, uh, who are um, acting uh, very much on children and less on adults. We don't know exactly uh, if there is one which is better than the other for the adults. And we are discussing, it's a very difficult discussion, to how we switch, uh, how we tr with which drugs should we treat the patient. And we will we, have probably the same model for Pompe. Currently in France, we have only the possibility to treat uh, with uh, next viadigm, so the discussion is relatively easy because we discuss switch or not switch, but even this, it is there is a necessity of discussion because some patients are stable, relatively stable, or they have a mild decline, and it is not because they have, there is a mild decline that we need to switch. This is a discussion, an ongoing discussion. Uh, and I would, uh, the question I would like to, to ask you is regarding the, the biomarkers, because one of the huge problems, uh, I have my feeling, is that you, we don't have uh, good biomarkers in adults in particular, because in pediatry you have uh, biomarkers, but we, we don't have biomarkers uh, predicting the disease evolution, and we don't have biomarkers predicting the response of any treatment. So. Uh, uh, the question regarding the, the current biomarker, uh, uh, X4 in urines, and uh, uh, antibodies against uh, uh, um, ERT, uh, do, do you think that we, 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 we under-analyze this uh, biomarker? Because in, in our practice, we don't discuss a lot about uh, this. When we discuss the switching of patients, uh, you have the clinical features, but also these biomarkers. Should we do more? At pay more interest uh, to this? Uh, are we lacking uh, data? What, what, do, what do you think uh, regarding antibody and X4? Yeah, I, I think that we currently ha do not have the ideal biomarker for pompous disease. So we need Giancarlo. And yeah. Uh, Pascal, if you actually see the data from both the clinical trials, whether it was Comet or whether it was Propel, they both have used urine HEX4. The urine HEX4 is not as elevated as it is in infantile. And I think there are a few reasons for it, right? You might be in a stage where there's more fibrosis, so there's less gly glycogen to give. If you look at the muscle biopsy of an infant versus someone with late onset, adult with late onset, and you compare what the glycogen content is, it is less. However, when you have switched those patients, that biomarker has come down, the CK has come down, and it has been called a pharmacodynamic marker. It's not the ideal marker, but it is an indirect. It is giving you some information. So I do think it is useful. If you look at the package label, you can also see in the next Viazyme package label, that those patients who had the higher antibody titers, more than 12,800, the HEX4 came down less as compared to those who did not have antibodies. 
So I still think there's a role for evaluating these and looking at it in a holistic picture with the patient. Let's go back there, and then I think we've got an online. Okay. Uh, we study the metabolic control of epigenetic regulation, and uh, I have a question regarding POMP. Is it possible that the heterogeneity of the clinical phenotype uh, could be associated with epigenetic changes, uh, specifically in early onset POMP? And, and I ask this question because there's, uh, there's a patient that has GAA levels that have increased several fold after incorporating things like what Dr. Tarpanowski is doing, like mitochondrial uh, therapies, th and the GAA levels are increasing for classical early onset POMP. So is this, what could explain that and could it potentially be uh, epigenetic regulation? And is, is this something that should be looked at? Um, to my knowledge, it has not been looked at. And whether there is a role, I think we could answer if we've looked at it, but clearly there are other factors, and epigenetics could be one of them. In particular for infantile, I'm not certain because I think they're having two very deleterious mutations results in a phenotype. I'm not aware of how you can increase that without replacing the missing enzyme, but clearly food for thought, and yeah. we should look into it. Well, I have blood work that shows like an increase from 0 0.1 GAA to 1.49 uh, over time. So I'm just thinking about like what could potentially be altering, could there be compensatory epigenetic regulations and it seems like maybe, and they're incorporating some of the things that Dr. Tarpanowski is using, so maybe there's some epigenetic modulation going on there. And we've all certainly got sibling pairs who are very different with their Pompe disease. So they have the same mutations, but for some reason one is milder than the other. And we, we all have those patients. So I think you're right. There's a lot of uncertainty about these modifier genes, sociogenomic issues, uh, obesity that may come into these differences in siblings. Thanks. <laughs> So, but if I, understand, if I understand the question, yep. Yep. it's asking, can you change somebody's underlying glycogen, right? That's what you're asking, GAA enzyme. Is it possible to change the underlying GAA activity? Now, in fact, that is uh, something that is investigated. Uh, for example, to say, uh, if you look at the IVS1 mutation, that's a splice site mutation, and uh, the activity uh, depends on the, yeah, on the correctness of splicing. So in 10 to 20% of the events, it goes right, and then you have normal alpha glucosidase activity, but in a reduced amount, so 10 to 20%. And uh, one of the approaches that's also done in our lab by Pim Pineapple is, for example, to see whether you can increase the uh, correctness of splicing with, for example, AONs. So that could be an approach. But of course, then you also have to have get the, uh, the AONs inside the muscle cells. That's done for other uh, diseases, but still things. So in conclusion, it can be modified. It can be modified. Oh, Pim is over there. Uh, Pim, maybe you could have a microphone. You were referring to a classic infantile patient, is that correct? Yeah, classic infantile or infantile? Yeah, that definitely no, no, that's does. A, I mean, important okay, here. classic infantile. Yeah, yeah, so then it's okay. impossible. Okay. I mean, 100 times zero is still zero. Exactly. Yeah. You cannot increase a zero activity. So what we are now talking about is uh, late onset. Yeah. Otherwise, it's completely impossible. So then there's something wrong with the enzyme measurement. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, then I misunderstood the question. Yeah. Sorry. G good that you corrected me. Yeah. Uh, can, can you wait for the microphone? Yeah. Or, or perhaps this is something for later. Yeah, or we can discuss this later. You can ask them. 
All right, who else has a question? Uh, we have a question from a virtual attendee. Uh, they ask, in a previous session, a parent told us her son started treatment despite being asymptomatic. What would cause a doctor to recommend starting treatment before exhibiting any symptoms? I, I think the, the, the challenge sometimes is understanding what that word means of symptoms. And I think as Laura Case was mentioning earlier, you can have very subtle changes. So axial weakness, weakness in the paraspinal muscles, is not easy to assess compared to weakness, for example, around the shoulder and hip girdle. So it may be that that doctor felt that the, there was some subtle clinical change um, that encouraged them to commence treatment. Um, I think the mother in question is over there. Let's, uh, yeah, okay. Is anybody from Dr. Batley's team here? Okay, so when my son was evaluated by Dr. Batley, she made the determination that if he had an early intervention, since he is currently clinically asymptomatic, that's just from a physical exam, even though all of the markers show, right, the disease is active in his body, that he has a chance to be as healthy as possible as long as possible. And my husband and I agreed that that would be the best course of action for him based on her recommendation. If any of the experts in the room feel differently, I would love to hear from you. I think maybe one thing you said that's important is all of the other blood work showed that the disease was present. So that means the disease is present. And I think as we spoke offline, there needed to be further assessments, like a physical therapy assessment, a pulmonary assessment, maybe a sleep study, depending on if there's a history of you know, sleep apnea, et cetera, um, the use of imaging modalities. And so we, having the full picture before calling someone asymptomatic is very important to even what Mark said. We have a, we have a question over here. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah, okay. um, I am a late onset palm pay person. My name is Margaret. Um, I am curious. I have a, two different genes, uh, both an infantile and a late onset. Um, I'm curious if y'all have seen as doctors a um, more of a uh, presentation with having the infantile and the late than just two late onsets. We see that a lot, Margaret, like one late onset, like the IVS splice site, and then another pathogenic variant which has been seen in infantile. But the fact that you have the IVS splice, splice site makes you late onset. And that has been seen, Margaret, if that's your question. So I think she's asked, she was asking me earlier how to ask this question. So. Um, since you guys have a long depth of experience with this, when, they per, when, a, when a person who has a late onset Pompeii gene and an early onset Pompeii gene, do they present earlier um, in, their, in their lifetime? Um, and what, what are some of the things that you have experience with because she's new to all of this? Um, and, and what does that look like from your experience that you guys have had? This is a very complicated question that you ask, but if you look at the late onset patients, I think over 90% of the Caucasian patients have the IVS1 mutation and a severe mutation on the other allele. But what we also see is that there's a very huge var variation in when the first symptoms present, and that may be in childhood, and that may be also as late as 60 or 70 sometimes. So there is not a strict picture there how the situation will evolve. And there I think it's very important based on all the assessments and how the progression of disease has evolved over the, over the time to look to the data, to do a regular follow-up, to get more grip on the process and discuss it on a regular basis with your doctor on basis of these data. Yeah, I, I just want to actually expand on what Priya has said. So uh, we had a few patients that uh, came with the woozers and the common mutations. And then um, when the patients were evaluated at places that do not see the patients regularly with Pompe disease, they were actually 
determined to be asymptomatic or minimally clinically symptomatic. But when we do the imaging on these patients, whole body MRI with fat water fraction, we see extensive replacement of the fat, these muscles, you know, that start from the tongue back to the, the, the large muscle groups. So even though it is mostly we rely on our clinical assessment in the clinic, honestly, these biomarkers, including imaging and other other earlier biomarkers like HEX4, CK, should lead the clinician to make decisions. The reason is when the muscle is replaced by fat, there is no return for that, okay? We cannot revive, there is no phoenix here, all right? So basically you need to make a decision when is the right time for the non-returnable findings to arise. And mostly the clinical findings are non-returnable. And most of my patients are very, very advanced. And unfortunately, Pom I, I care of multiple lysosomal disorders. And unfortunately, Pompe disease is not one of the disorder that has a very large phenotypic um, distribution like some other disorders, like Gaucher disease. I mean, within one mutation, there can be no, uh, no symptoms, whereas really, really symptomatic ones, like in Pompe disease too. But whoever I've seen with Pompe disease, they are advanced, and unfortunately, they are very late treated. So that is one of the problems with LLPD I'm referring to. Um, this is Aslan Gokharov, and I am the, um, the founder and the director of LDRTC. We have a little booth here. Thank you. You know, I think what I'd be keen to reassure patients about is we are absolutely passionate about the preservation of health and we're not interested in the treatment of entrenched disease. So whilst there are financial problems because the enzymes are, are clearly expensive, and this was a point your pediatric colleague made earlier, if it was as cheap as aspirin, we'd be putting everyone on it, wouldn't we? Meaning those who would become symptomatic and those who might not. But there has to be some metric that gives us confidence that what we're doing will have a benefit for the patient. And I think, for example, physiotherapy is incredibly important as an assessment. I think PROs are very important as an assessment, and not just vital capacity and six-minute walking time. Uh, Dr. Oh, over here, I'm sorry. Um, I have an easy question. <laughs> um, so I am a Pompeii patient. Um, I was wondering what are your thoughts on digital wearable devices and how do we, um, how do we encourage doctors to work with their patients in using them? How do, how do we incorporate that in our treatment? Um, in September and November, I was in a cardiac, cardiac episode in the emergency room tracking it with my Apple Watch. And I was trying to show the doctor this information. They were not at all interested in seeing it. They triaged me and sat me in the, in the waiting room for 12 hours. Um, this was very easy data to look at. And so how do we get doctors to buy into the value of this data so that, again, we talked about patients and doctors working together um, this was ignored and, and for, in my personal experience. Thank you. Well, I can, I can answer to this. Uh, so <clears throat> if it would be the patient you and, and would be in my emergency room, I would have looked at this because that's the new way. We have to go to this. I fully agree this is something we are too conservative here, what we are doing. We are still having, I always say, the, the outcome measures of the past century and we did not develop them further, and we need to do this. But now we are bound a bit by the authorities to use them in, in the long run, but nevertheless, we have to modify them. So there are good new ways in monitoring. So many of you in the room have done a six-minute walk test. So this is one of the boring tests you can ever do. And of course, we know the, the consequences of this, yeah. but it, it's really something, it's completely artificial. It's not the natural way uh, how to monitoring things. And we have to come up with these digital technologies to use them, to implement them. 
but it needs a time where we do, and therefore we need these patient registries and outcomes where we do it in parallel, that we really see what is working well, how can we continue with this, and there's, of course, uh, the data uh, security element in it that's not easy to be solved. It might be easy over here in the U.S. In Europe, we have a data curator, a data officer in nearly every uh, university that is different, things like that. So there were some legal issues we have to overcome, but of course, it will be the future for all neuromuscular diseases. And I can tell you that for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there was now for the first time a clinical trial used for the first time a digital readout as the primary endpoint. So that is the, the icebreaker in my eyes for all new uh, clinical trials that we can use them not only as a supplementary endpoint, we can use them as primary endpoint and we need to work on this. Hi, uh, my I, name is Virginia Kimonis. Just, just a second, Virginia, to her point. This is really important because this was not advice for seeing her distance walk. This was like a life emergency, and I think that these devices have two utilizations. One is, of course, in monitoring our patients, but the second is, like, as a false risk device, we use the Apple Watch, and also, you know, when someone is having a heart rhythm disturbance. And so, Heather, I would really encourage you this needs to be brought up to the level of the f hospital, you know, to, to raise attention to this, mm -hmm. because this could have cost someone their life, mm -hmm. where you've got an ongoing arrhythmia and you're asked to wait for 12 hours. And so I just feel this is very important for our patients to hear that the utility of these are twofold, life-saving and also for clinical yes. trials. We have time for two more questions. So uh, Hi, just a quick mm -hmm. um, point on it's not necessarily a question. So I want um, um, to note that um, enzymes are the mainstay of treatment, but we mustn't forget adjunct treatments like uh, exercise therapy. Um, so I published um, uh, in Dr. Schloss's journal uh, a nice article about using exercise and respiratory resistance uh, training, and the results were spectacular better than any enzyme or any novel treatment, but we neglect that in our recommendations. So I don't know if the panel has any advice on how we can make people uh, realize that those are um, important and very cheap. I, I'm going to jump oh, in and suggest that we work together, maybe perhaps the IPA, with the expert community on um, guidelines and recommendations. I have the last question here. So first I want to say thank you to all of you. This is the first time I've been to this meeting and I have a daughter with Pompeii sitting behind me and as a parent hearing, you know, seeing newborn screening in the last few years, seeing that come out, seeing the things that in the advancements and we talk about the price of the treatment. As a parent, I don't see any reason why if my newborn child is identified as a Pompeii patient, I wouldn't start treatment immediately because y'all have all said it. Once you start seeing those physical symptoms, you can't get that back. I don't, in the, the second piece, I work, I work in the commercial side of medicine, so more patients, the better, because that also goes to demand and reducing cost of treatment. What, how can we move this forward and how can I as a parent help this process because, I mean, I, I just see the need for it. I know that this is something we can cure in the next 10 to 20 years, and the only way, way we do that is to continue to identify more patients and continue to be able to work for that treatment. I, I think we're all in agreement that um, the earlier we diagnose, the earlier we're able to monitor and the earlier we're able to intervene if there is a need to intervene. And I think that for me personally, newborn screening in the US was an eye opener beyond IOPD, which of course, it has completely changed the landscape of how even those children are doing, but also for our children with LOPD, where a subset of them who have required treatment and are showing the benefits of treatment, uh, we are seeing that right now. So we are in agreement, I think all of us are. So we're out of time, but I'm going to ask one question because I'm going to ask it. Uh, 
for all of you, if you had one piece of advice for patients, what would it be? My, my advice is that, um, that enzyme therapy alone is not the holy grail. It's not so that you take enzyme replacement therapy and you can sit and wait what happens. You have to be active yourself and be proactive and do training. See whether you can keep your weight in a, in a good shape. Uh, do, for example, what just was advised, uh, respiratory resistance training to improve your uh, respiratory condition. So it's not something that you, uh, so it's mutual uh, responsibility, I think. I, I would also ask all of you to be proactive with your treating physicians. I think everyone wants to do their best. It's a busy practice, but I think you are the best to advocate for yourselves. And so requesting you know, certain assessments to be done, especially um, at regular intervals, you know, monitoring of antibodies, monitoring of your biomarkers, and before you make a switch or a decision is made to make a switch, having some baseline assessments um, so that there is a way to monitor you in a measurable way um, and also to do the PROs, et cetera. And I would check vitamin D. Yes. You know, it's, it's crazy to have this intrusive in intravenous treatment if you don't optimize nutrition and if you don't think about vitamin D because of its benefits on skin, muscle, bone health, and the immune system. So it's such an easy, low-hanging fruit. Check your vitamin D levels and go on treatment. And if your vit vitamin D levels are low, stay on vitamin D. It's not a course, it's a long-term strategy. Well, what would be my advice? My advice is integrate it in your life. So don't see it always as a disease and a handicap. Try to, to overcome this, and especially if you go, you need exercise. But exercise needs to be adopted to your personality. So you need to find your way of sport, whatever it is, but it needs to be something that is really not an extra task you just need to do because you are diseased. And that's not easy, but you should work on this, uh, and that will integrate and help you the best way you can do for your life, uh, depending on, not depending on any enzyme, not depending on any uh, gene therapy, hopefully, that will come along. So integrate it. I think that's, that's most important. Don't see it always as something that's not belonging to me. You will have, unfortunately, a phase in your life where it's overcoming uh, to you so that you see, well, I'm, I'm more handicapped and have more things I can't do. But there are periods, there's always stable periods in the disease. So this is completely independent to the treatment. And in this period, try to be most holistic and try to integrate it in a normal life. Uh, that's really, there's always ways to do that. And a lot of people have shown that, and a lot of people here in the room, and someone is sitting next to me who is doing this always, so what do I capable with the disease? And she's integrating that, and that's important. Thank you, and on that note. <laughs> on that note, we're gonna transfer from this panel uh, round table of experts to the next expert roundtable, patience.